So how is your shy pair? Uh, giving you my thoughts about really two issues. Uh, first issue is the Bitcoin fork in which Bitcoin Cash has forked from Bitcoin Core or Bitcoin Regular. I'm not gonna completely talk about it here, only to acknowledge that it has occurred. Blocks are going, uh, it's a few blocks behind the actual Bitcoin Core, so there's not any issue with reorganization or any issue of some kind of conflict because Bitcoin Cash does in fact have replay protection so if you do a transaction on the Bitcoin Core it's not going to um, after the August 1st date if you did a transaction after that on the Bitcoin Core it's not going to show up on the Bitcoin Cash and vice versa with the Bitcoin Cash where the Bitcoin Cash is not going to transaction is not going to show up, show up on the Bitcoin Core so that issue is not going to occur um, the price value has significantly dropped more exchanges are accepting trades and or at least uh, allowing their customers that had held Bitcoin uh, Core on their exchanges to be able to uh, receive Bitcoin Cash on the exchange or at least withdraw their Bitcoin uh, Core and they can go through the process on their own of receiving the Bitcoin Cash. Um, Coinbase is still having issues. They're saying there could be custodial holders of everyone's Bitcoin Cash to January 1st of 2018. They're gonna get sued. That's that's some bullshit. It's not their property, really. Granted, yes, private keys. If you don't own your private keys, then you don't own your Bitcoin. You don't control your Bitcoin. Uh, but Coinbase has maintained its position as a custodial holder and I think there's already existing laws, particularly when it comes to like stock splitting and stuff like that, that they may not even have a legal position to be custodial holders and denying access to their customers to those to those uh, coins. But we'll see. Uh, the price is still continuing to drop. Uh, I'm not sure how far down Bitcoin Cash is going to go. I see some wild predictions to like a dollar to maybe around 200. We will see. I think as a lot of the attacks that have been happening on Bitcoin Cash, um, they were getting DDoS, uh, mining switching on and off. As soon as that resolves and there is a kind of a concrete hashing power, because it continues to change the difficulty from the height of Bitcoin Core to the much lower difficulty rating to the existing hashing power and to what is already existing, you know, network effect, if you will, of the current Bitcoin Cash usage. Uh, I think that you're going to see a lot of people just mining for the purpose of switching out. I do think that eventually there might be some uh, individuals that will start accepting Bitcoin Cash as a payment service, but this is like, or like four days into this. This is August 4th, so we're four days into this, so who knows what's going to happen. And still, on the Bitcoin Core end, you still have two megabyte hard fork happening or planning sometime the price aren't going to launch in uh, code sometime in September, possibly October. It's November is the, the D day, and we're going to may end up seeing another fork if there is no code release indicating a raise of the two megabytes on the uh, Bitcoin core end. There could be another fork because there's miners, particularly miners and businesses, and those who agree to the New York agreement that want the two megabyte raise. So there could eventually be three Bitcoins. That's the strongest, uh, or three variations of Bitcoins. That is the strongest contenders. Eventually, there could be a potential five Bitcoins, as we discussed. Um, I'm, using, I'm using the Shy podcast when we talked about forking. But right now, the, the, the probabilities are high for three. If the two megabyte does not occur. I think it's going to occur considering how this particular fork has broken away there's really you know there's some people going and using it um the network effect hasn't dramatically damaged bitcoin it's actually gone up in price and then went down it's gone up gone down so who knows i i think considering that people are willing to put their effort and money and time towards bitcoin cash i you know again it, it really depends i would say october time 
if there hasn't been any code that shows up, it really sees how Bitcoin Cash is doing at that point in time, like what its price is, what its network effect, how, you know, its hashing rate, its no count, uh, how many merchants are accepting it, uh, what the trade or liquidity is going, because people consider that to be important. Um, we'll see. We'll see where that position is. If it's still significant, even if it's much lower than the regular Bitcoin Core, uh, if it's trading significantly high, I say around the $100, $150 range, then there could be a, f a fork because that means there's economic value in forking and having that two megabyte raise if you're having coins trading around the $100, $150. Even if it's a dollar or two or five dollars, if there is actual still economic value to Bitcoin Cash, there still will be a fork. I, I do. But if it's just and fizzle out as many have predicted that the, the hashing power and the mining and the, the economy is not going to go to that direction then yeah but this is like a wait and see game there's like a lot of things that have to happen down those and it just takes you know time you know i'm not a time traveler so i can't jump ahead and see what's going to happen there but it would be interesting to see what the outcome is my second thought is about btce now I'm going to do an episode on it, on Musings in the Shive. I think I need to wait for a little bit more information. But my personal concern or confusion really is the level of charges against uh, Vintin, how do you pronounce his name? Uh, Vikin Butin, that, you know, he's facing money laundering charges. I'm not sure if that is actually the appropriate accounts attached to him. Because what they're stating is, and these all indications and reports, is that he is being indicted for money laundering concerning the Mt. Gox theft, which occurred in 2011. Now, money laundering has a five-year, five-year, a five-year statute of limitations. So, if the initial theft occurred in 2011, between the time frame of 2011, 12, and 13 is when these coins were stolen from Mt. Gox. Um, because what happened was, somehow, either an insider job or a hacker attained the DAT file for Mt. Gox. And they had full-on access, and they were withdrawing coins um, from that DAT file as uh, Bitcoins were coming in. And, and taking it, and then... Uh, even trading back on Mt. Gox with those coins and consistently doing so all the way up to the closure of Mt. Gox 2013 when it became very clear that it was uh, insolvent and eventually declared bankruptcy in 2014. So the earliest action, if you will, is 2011. Well, it's 2017 now. And so those initial funds that they were money laundered through uh, BTC E, which was founded in 2011, the statute of limitations on those actions are done now any actions for the events in 2013 are not over or 2012 because it hasn't been the five year five years for my research five years for money laundering it's actually a limitations if you will hasn't gone up now yeah the other issue i have is it wasn't until 2013 that the u.s through fincen and the irs the irs declared Bitcoin to be a property and that's how it was going to be taxed. FinCEN treated it as a commodity type of action, not currency. is never considered currency and you had to have a money transmitting license in order to to trade, so in order to send and receive and trade on uh, cryptocurrencies. That's, that's what FinCEN has and that's why there was a lot of exchanges that shut down during that period of time. They were trying to get licenses seen kind of regulatory. This is why people on local Bitcoin or any peer-to-peer -peer transactions are getting busted because they don't have the money transmitting license. Uh, I believe New Hampshire is one of the only states when it comes to cryptocurrencies um, where they specify the law you don't need a money transmitting license. So on the state end you don't need it there. And it kind of gets a little weird with the federal end where you have to have a federal license, but you can get away with just having a state license. And if your state doesn't require you to have one, so you don't have to have one, it's it's a really tricky, because I'm not a lawyer, so it's a little hazy and a little confusing. I think it's a little 
bit intentional on the government end, if you will, when it comes to these regulations. But if it's a property and a commodity and it wasn't declared until basically mid-2013, then how is it money laundering? Because the whole function of money laundering is to take funds, money, currency, and obfuscate its origin because it has some criminal action and evade tax purposes. Don't get me wrong, it's theft. So you can get them for receiving stolen goods, but money laundering for actions that occurred between the 2011 and 2013 when there was no regulations or declarations of Bitcoin as any type of currency. And there's already a couple cases on state ends concerning that one in Florida stating it was currency. So money laundering in the state didn't apply like it wasn't currency so you can utilize it. That's this is, I mean, they're trying to play a gosh you game. They want to take this person down. They, they basically, what it was was a ransomware. Yes, everyone's saying it's the Mt. Gox, and they tra traced it all back, all the way back to this exchange, and Winsec did all this work. But it was really the ransomware stuff that, because ransomware was, uh, bitcoins were funneled through BTCE. That's really what it was. You, you kind of tipped the nose of some very powerful people, and they didn't like it. I think that's what really was. The other thing is the fact that it. Um, Yes, there were U.S. customers utilizing his exchange, or whether or not he. There's even clarity whether or not he actually is a owner, or proprietor, or basically might have been just a trader utilizing BTCE. There's not very clear clarity on that. The government's position is that he is the owner and operator, and that he utilized BTCE for the, the purposes of money laundering. But it's based, you know, in Russia, Cyprus, and all these other places. And yes, there's. Um, a couple different acts and treaties that some of these places may have been signatory to and that's why they got them but I don't believe Russia is one of them so so I'm not sure exactly if the government's overreaching there's been no mums of word on the Russian end and whether or not they're going to support their Russian citizen here as far as preventing extradition you know he's been trying to be extradited at Greece it most likely is going to occur he's going to be extradited out of Greece but when it comes to his trial here state size if he doesn't already like concede the point and make a deal because he's facing up to 55 years in prison um, again I still I need some clarity I need some kind of analysis maybe a lawyer within the community to express or explain how this uh, what was being done with utilizing a Bitcoin is considered money laundering when it's not considered even a currency. How is that even applicable? Now, taking stolen funds? Yes. Maybe the tax thing because he, in, at least stateside you have to pay taxes so any customers that may have utilized BTCE had to pay taxes and weren't tax compliant. The, K, K, or K, the email and KYC stuff for money transferring the license I know they didn't have really good ID verifications, but if they are based in Cyprus, did they really have to? I mean, if they had a this statement declaring that they didn't want to utilize U.S. customers or abandoning U.S. IP addresses, which are some exchanges are doing, saying that we don't want to deal with Americans because of regulation, which no indication BTC had that type of clause. Is it BTT's fault that Americans were utilizing their exchanges and breaking the laws there? Again, that, these are just kind of questions that I don't think are being asked because people were cheering on the fact that the Mt. Gox theft has been found, you know, the bad guys are caught up, and there's so much more to this than just good and bad and, you know, evil versus, you know, evil bad people or, or, or whatever. There's, there's so much more going on. And I think allowing the United States at least within the community and not having pushing back against this type of a court case is very dangerous because what it's going to do is end up centralizing exchanges much like mining has been centralized just to do the sheer fact of the invention of ASIC mining but again these are just my thoughts um, I'm going to do an episode of Using the Shine podcast I'll link in the show notes too if you want to subscribe to the podcast sometime next week maybe a week after I'm kind of kind of topped out when it comes to the discussion of Bitcoin but eventually I'm going to just have to uh, address the issue because it's important to the community. 
But that's it for now. Thank you for listening and shoot the moon.